Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Leah Miller and I am with Creative Aging Network of North Carolina. And we are so happy to have received funding from Carolina Foundation for Jewish Seniors for, to be able to do this program. And I would like to introduce our um, speaker and our teacher today, Ms. Karen Dresser or Dr. Dresser. Um, she earned her PhD at UNCG, at UNC Greensboro and her Masters of Divinity at Wake Forest University. She's taught and tutored at Temple Emanuel, Beth David Synagogue, B'nai Shalom Day School, and formerly at American Hebrew Academy and the School of Divinity at Wake Forest University as an adjunct professor. Karen currently teaches part-time. Um, she teaches Jewish studies, art, theater, writing, and she's an artist, a singer, a songwriter, a playwright, a director, and a cantorial, cantorial soloist, which I don't know how you have time to do everything. Uh, <laughs> very impressive. Uh, her ritual art can be seen in various universities, synagogues, churches, and Islamic centers throughout the country and in private homes worldwide. So I introduce to you, Dr. Dresser. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Um, as I was thinking about today, I was, I, I was saying to myself, with everything going on in the world, how many people are going to want to hear about the Holocaust? And yet I, I think with all the anti-Semitism and the genocides that are going on worldwide, we need to still engage it. Uh, it's very important for us to remember um, and to privilege those who are still living among us for their words and their memories. Um, I, I believe I, I just said that we're going to, I'm going to share a screen. So I'm not going to be able to see your faces. I don't know. You probably won't be able to see people's faces either. So we'll see how this goes. And I'll try to check the, the chats from time to time too. Um, let me make sure this is working. Uh, it looks good. Okay. Does it look even better now? It looks even better now. <laughs> okay. I, I've got the little picture in the side, but I'm going to take that away so you can see all of it. <clears throat> so art after the Holocaust. Um, I will start by saying that during the Holocaust, there were many artists whose lives were saved because they could do art. The art that they were forced to do were cards for the Nazis to give on holidays or portraits of guards and uh, commanders in the, the camps. Um, not something they wanted to be doing, but because of their privileged status, they were able to use the materials to create pieces of the horrors that they saw around them. Um, some of these you will see in, um, in painted forms afterwards, but I, I would like to tell you that this happened and um, the ones that, that were kept their lives because of their talent. Um, we just, we can be very grateful for that. This is such a brief introduction to Holocaust art. And I will say that I have privileged certain um, artists that I like and certain ways of looking at things that I have taught in the past to my uh, high school students and to uh, divinity school students. But right now, my present goals are to present visual art and artists who engage the Holocaust, to weave together art and post-Holocaust theology. So there's, there will be some thoughts in here that I would like for us to stop and talk about, to introduce new ways of thinking about the Holocaust visually and through the theological ideas, and to encourage all of you to question what you see 
and what you assume about the Holocaust through some of the art. Um, I will also tell you that there is some very, very controversial art at the very end. Um, that some of the in images um, may make you very angry. When they were presented at the Jewish Museum uh, as a show called Mirroring Evil, they were indeed very controversial then too. So um, that's just a, a little a note. And I will I'll tell you when we get there, you can you can turn off your screen if you want at that point. So a partial list of questions we must ask when viewing Holocaust art. In remembering the past, in order to present it to the future, what tools does the artist use in processing a memory? So is the artist a survivor, a second or third generation survivor, child or grandchild of a Holocaust survivor, a perpetrator, or is the artist looking at perpetrator memories, newspaper, historical sources, others? How do memory, history, and visual culture relate to each other in the artwork? Does the visual work of art resemble or, or uh, differ from that presented by historical and literary texts? And how do the elements of art, such as spatial arrangements, forms, and sites of representation position the view so as to encourage or discourage, include or exclude specific interpretations. Uh, one of my favorite artists, Samuel Bach, uses a lot of biblical uh, iconography in his art. Eliezer Berkowitz, Faith After Auschwitz, those of us who are not there must heed the responses of those who were, for theirs alone are the authentic ones. We can say that for art too. Those who were there and did art from their memories, those are the, the authentic art. And yet, we have other people doing Holocaust art. I myself have done some Holocaust art. So we have to be careful though, when we look at those who are using a variety of sources to figure out what, what is the um, authentic voice here or what is the authentic image. So I would like for you to look at this painting by Samuel Bach. This is a very, uh, it, it, it's his style. Um, he uses a lot of desolation, a world after the Holocaust that for him was crumbling, falling apart. And if there's someone who would like to take uh, a step to interpret this, or at least tell us what you see in it, and then someone else could interpret it, um, please do. Just um, say who you are, Un unmute first and say who you are and how you're looking at this painting. We've got some th someone here from Oasis. All right. Uh, I've been looking at this for as long as it's been up there, and I just saw the eye. Mm -hmm. um, and that, oh, that kind of got to me. Yeah. <laughs> About the whole oh, yeah, I see right the, here. I see the eye, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's the snake down there at the bottom. It's, it's a snake and it's also a question mark. Oh. He uses a lot of question marks because he continues to question meaning of, of the event. And he is a survivor, by the way. 
I guess that's the uh, the crematory the crematory in the, in, up in the upper middle or towards the left. Yes. Oh. Yep. He uses a lot of those, the chimneys. And then the trash heap in that bowl um, with looks like a synagogue on top of it or a Torah. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of symbolism in it. Anyone want to um, wager a guess at <laughs> what what this the, the main emphasis of this is? I, I think that it's showing that a lot of people were blind to what was going on. Yes. What else? And they, they wanted to ignore it. And they didn't think it was, they, they were, they, they thought the stories were made up. So they didn't want to believe it. Um, so they did nothing. So I think that's, you know, the main emphasis is showing the bandages over the people and also their mouth and their eyes. So they said nothing and they saw nothing. Nice, yep. This is Paula Katz. Um, are those like scales of justice? Yes, indeed they are, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. I can't tell like in that one scale that looks like the destruction of, I don't know, a temple or a um, home or it's just destruction. This one, this Very, one here. Can yes. you see my pointer? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very apocalyptic. Very mm -hmm. post. Yeah. Disaster. Ugh. Um, movies I avoid watching. Yes. Mm -hmm. He has a mask. He's he or she. I can't tell gender is holding a mask. Um, I'm not sure the symbolism of the mask they're holding. Um, not sure what that meaning is, but it sticks out. Mm -hmm. This is Wendy Cutler. Down yes. near the question mark, I see arms coming out from almost like a hooded skeletal person. Like the face near the top, it you know it, it part of it almost looks like a decayed tree trunk or rock formation. Uh huh. Um, but as you move at the tail of the <clears throat> excuse me question mark there, I see a couple hands with arms, uh -huh. and right above that, almost like a face within a hooded, hooded cloak. Right here. No, towards move to the right there, right below yeah. that. Yes. Go down. That's the hood, and inside it is the skeletal face come down a little to the left now up a little right there oh right there yeah so you know they're questioning from maybe the hereafter mm. why did this happen how did we allow this to happen yeah and and there i mean i see other faces in here too i there are faces i think even in the rocks um so those and that, that top scale on the right side there that that looks like a tower right below the rope those what could be windows also look like they could be faces yes could be eyes could yep. further up it will throughout the whole thing yeah the color palette is very um one that is re repeated often with Samuel Bach. And I, I, mean, I think it's um, just the drabness of the scenery and the, the destruction. Whose eye is this? Can we talk? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm seeing, I was just going to speak about, about that, that I think the ladies or the man standing there with the mask, it's kind of like the people that were, had their eyes covered and did not say anything. They mm -hmm. were looking, but they didn't speak. And the horror totally outweighed those people because the scale has broken on the other side where the 
where the trash heap and all that is. And yes. it's like, um, I'm seeing the, you know, that the people that, well, she didn't speak, so it's just looking, and that's the eye. They're only looking at what was happening. They weren't, they weren't speaking or doing anything about it, and the horror mm -hmm. weighed them. That's how I'm seeing that. Yes, and it is Lady Justice. Okay. It, yeah, it is Lady Justice. Okay. That makes sense. He, um, he uses various icons from the you know, from history and from culture uh, in his paintings. At, at one point, he was doing pairs to represent the human body, um, and so. But going back to this, whose eye? I I think it's the eye of the world, and basically, it's saying that you will eventually find out what really happened. But it might, but it might be too. But it's going to cost a lot of lives. Mm. So basically, the eye of regret, um, basically saying, "Look what we look. We saw, but well, you didn't do anything about it. But eventually, um, will all the truth will come out. So it's the all-knowing eye that will um, come out at the end and say, "I, I." I, I we still have witnesses that proved everything that happened and they are going to be around for ages mm. to remind us of what had happened. So that's the yep. eye, eye of the future, and the eye of looking back, and it's the eyewitness reports, I would think. Very nice. Could it be anyone else's eye? God's eye? I, I, I tend to looking at, look at it as God's eye in the same way that humanity didn't do anything, mm -hmm. that God didn't do anything. Those who were expecting God to do something were, were, were mm -hmm. sorely um, surprised when nothing happened, when there wasn't any kind of intervention godly intervention, miraculous intervention. But I think it has multiple interpretations as, as do everything that we read in Torah. There are so many ways to interpret things and for paintings too. If we are not the artist, unless we hear from the artist's mouth, we interpret it through our own lens too. So I'm going to go on to the next one, unless anyone else has something to say about this. How, how about, sorry, the green yes. around the eye? What would that, this is Loli Clara. Yes. Around the eye. This um, the, garment. Yes, yes. I was thinking of it as leaves, leaves. Yeah, it's some, some it, it does look one. like leaves, but uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Wonder, yeah. Some, maybe something comforting um, that one could wrap oneself in, but hide. Yeah. Pretty, pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. one, right. one more comment. One more comment. Yes. Yes. Think of the title taking off. I'm looking at the river or the water. Yes. It looks like it's getting brighter as it comes forward. The water in the back is is the same deep, you know, the dark color of the, of the mountains, and, and um, but as it's coming forward, it looks like it's gotten brighter. So, what could that mean in terms of this painting and what the other images that it's getting brighter? I think it has to do perhaps with the eye too, that the eye is 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 looking and seeing and <clears throat> and perhaps. The illumination of the water is helping the eye see mm. more of what's there. Yeah, that, that green is puzzling me also because I was going to mm. ask a question about that. Yeah, it looks like leaves and it looks like a blanket. Yeah. Mm. The eye too is the same color as the water. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go into the next one. I, I have 50 slides, so <laughs> let's Hello. move on.
This is the one that was on the, the front cover. Look at the elements first, and then let's talk about it. And anyone who would like to speak first? Please do. Go ahead, Yulia. Imagination that somebody, it's the first image that somebody tries to help. Maybe I'm not right, but somebody trying to help. You understand? It looks like somebody is finally, you know, someone's trying to help. Yes. No. Is this is, is, is this Karen? Mar Marilyn? Yes. It is this is a takeoff on Michelangelo, correct? Yeah, correct. correct. And yeah. um so obviously God is only available that we know of from his wrist down. In the Michelangelo, what what is the What's he saying in the Michelangelo? In the Ma Michelangelo, it's God giving Adam a breath of life. Right. Okay. So did they touch? Did the hands touch? They did They did not touch. They did not touch. It okay. was reaching out as, yeah. as though okay. to. Yeah. So, so um, it's a mystery. Um, and this mankind can't reach can't touch God and it looks like God is not uh, available in this mess of the smoke and the destruction and the and the and the poverty and the hunger and um hey Bob it's Brenda is uh Diana available thank you that's all thank you Hey, Brenda, you're not muted. <laughs> um, Karen, I, yes. what, it, it's really, this is very abstract in my, in my perception because I'm seeing so much in this between the missile on the, on the left mm -hmm. side, the mm -hmm. destruction of the walls, the smoke from the smokestacks that take me right back to when I was on, you know, at Auschwitz. Mm. And, and the body that is no longer there and is sitting on the pile of, you know, clothes and shoes and what have you. And my first thought when I looked at this was, was Ukraine. Yes, I, I think we cannot help in our day looking at this without thinking of other things that are going on in the world, including Ukraine. Yeah. Clearly, we haven't learned from past history. Mm -hmm. a second, go ahead. Go ahead, Leanne. Is that a cross? Yes, indeed, it is. Yes. And what's around the cross? It's the road. It's actually a talit. It's a Ooh. Jewish. It's a Jewish prayer shawl right here. So why would a Jewish artist put a cross in one of his paintings? That's a that's a that's a question. I'm I'm thinking, Karen. Yes. That the reason he did that is to show that that the Catholic Church probably could have done more in helping save the Jews. And there were in fact some Catholics who actually did get killed in the Holocaust as well as Jewish people. Mm -hmm. and the Catholic Church did absolutely nothing or very little to help whether it was Jewish or Christian. So I think it was a, a statement saying because uh, I remember, I think it was some Polish Catholics that were rounded up 
had also killed as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think he was trying to say that, um, to say that, you know, we have a symbolism here and yet you didn't take advantage of, of you know, compassion. So I think that's what it is. And I think the man is reaching out to God for help. And I think that's another, rather than, so he's reaching out and saying, is there anybody gonna help me? Uh, yeah. I think, uh, Loli Clark, mm -hmm. yeah. I think he's trying to remind us that Jesus was Jewish with the Talit around the cross. Mm -hmm. that because the cross is almost out of the pick, the frame, that they didn't do anything. You know, they, they were kind of like looking from the side, from the sidelines. Yeah. The other I'm, thing that, oh, sorry, who was? That who was, was me. It was Wendy. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm also thinking, looking at it a little bit differently of the Tali kind of um, the cross being wrapped in the Tali in the warmth that that we we pray with it wrapped around us to acknowledge the righteous Gentiles. Oh, nice. Oh. Very nice. Yeah, that's nice. mm -hmm. and what I'm sorry, why would the arm be supported? You see how the arm of mm -hmm. supposedly God yes. is supported from I was gonna ask that too. It it looks like a fake arm that's just hanging yeah, on the wall. I've been <laughs> I've been attracted yeah. to that. It's like it's in the middle of the picture too, so they it's important. So I I, I will give you my explanation of this, how I view it. Um when one is in a situation such as the Holocaust, where there is little, little, um, hmm, how, how can I put this? Little of God in, in the daily life of the camps. One tries to create a sense of godliness in some way in this in this way, he, Bach, made a plaster image of a hand to put up there. And that, for him, represented the God that wasn't there. Oh. oh. But he's trying to make God there. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the other thing that I wanted to say about the cross is that um, while for Christians the cross represents the crucifixion of Jesus. For Jews, many Jews, and I mean thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews, were crucified by the Romans on the, um, the walls, the, the, the walls of Jerusalem, which were, you know, larger things, but not just, not just on the hills, but on, even on the walls. So for, for us, um, there was a sense of crucifixion happening all the time and that it became <clears throat> a part of, you know, a central part of a central sim sim uh, symbol for Christianity um, kind of negated the, the death of Jews too during the time of the Romans. So that's part of it. But I think that the tie-in with that and the Roman Catholic Church at the time bringing in what was on the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Um, it, it all plays in for him because he was, he and his mother were sheltered by nuns um, during the Holocaust. So he, he spent part of his time um, in a convent being being cared for by the nuns and hidden by the nuns i'm looking at the um is that it's part of the tree yes that looks, that looks like it's got perhaps a bandage wrapped around it uh -huh. and it can be used as a um, as a cane or a support for this man to be able to get up out of the, uh, out of his awful 
trash where he's sitting and, and all the destruction and, and um, the despair and trying to touch God's hand and then the tree and he's able to move over to the tree and use it to move forward. That is that is a good observation and interpretation. He uses the tree a lot. It is something that is rooted, but most of the time it is cut down in some sense. Here, he's propped it up. He says, I am not willing to get rid of my roots, my roots in Judaism, my, my belief in God. I'm not willing to get rid of it. I'm going to prop it up any way I can to sustain me to help me. So that that's a, an excellent um, observation and interpretation. I have a question. Yes. Um, is there any significance to the smoke coming out of the smokestacks in the back in uh, kind of in the letter C? Well, it's it's almost a backwards question mark too for him. Wow. He used question marks, but um, yeah, it, it, questioning the use of the crematory, mm -hmm. crematorium for um, for the deaths of so many, and I, I will say too that um, children, children from Jewish orphanages, were marched to the crematoria and thrown in alive. Yes. That's that's one of the um, the things that happened. So there's so much, so much in those images of the, the smokestacks. Thank you. I'm going to go on because I've got many, many more that are just equally interesting. He is, he's a prolific painter. He has hundreds and hundreds of paintings. Richard Rubenstein and 1966 was one of the first rabbi theologians to engage the idea of theology after Auschwitz. God really died at Auschwitz. This does not mean that God is not the beginning and will not be the end. It does mean that nothing in human choice, decision, value, or meaning can any longer have vertical reference to transcendent standards. We are alone in a silent, unfeeling cosmos. What do you think about that statement? Alone in a silent, unfeeling cosmos. What that means? That it means he doesn't believe in anything. He doesn't believe what? He doesn't believe in in God in anything. He doesn't ah. believe in any hell. And yet, he, and he yet, he's be alone. He yes, okay. The aloneness of of humankind um, after the Shoah after the Holocaust. You know, when you when you think of everything that happened from the beginning, when the Nazis were were um, practicing, I guess, on um, special needs people giving them certain medical medicines or, um, you know, experimenting on special needs people um, to, you know, uh, uh, doing experiments in the camps. And then, of course, the final solution, which was death. Um, all of that is so far from our, our mind. And yet, you know, we need to keep that close because if it happened once, it could very well happen again, depending on who's in charge and, you know, um, who's bombing whom. And uh, it's, it's a lot to think about. 
um, I want to I want to go on to this is about Samuel Bach. Samuel Bach was born in Vilna, Poland in 1933 at a crucial moment in, um, oh, my little thing is, wait, <laughs> go back. I can't read what that says because it says that I'm talking in modern history, I believe. From 1940 to 1944, Vilna was under Soviet and then German occupation. Bach's artistic, artistic talent was first recognized during an exhibition of his work in the ghetto of Vilna when he was nine years old. While he and his mother survived, his father and four grandparents all perished at the hands of the Nazis. Bach's work weaves together personal history and Jewish history to articulate an iconography of his Holocaust experience. Across seven decades of artistic production, Samuel Bach has explored and reworked a set of metaphors, a visual grammar, and a vocabulary that ultimately privileges questions. His art depicts a world destroyed and yet provisionally pieced back together preserving the memory of the 20th century ruination of Jewish life and culture by way of an artistic passion and precision that stubbornly announces the creativity of the human spirit. I want you to look at this image, famous photograph of the Warsaw boy, it's called. Um, this was from the Warsaw Ghetto. And there was, on April 19th, 1943, there was an uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto and the Jewish, um, the Jewish inhabitants of the ghetto resisted as long as they could. This was the largest uprising by Jews during World War II and the first significant urban revolt against German occupation in Europe. By May 16th, 1943, the Germans had crushed the uprising and deported surviving ghetto, ghetto residents to concentration camps and killing centers. This image for him, for Bach, though, is so important in his later work. Bach and his mother sought refuge in a Benedictine convent where a Catholic nun named Maria Mikulska tried to help them. After returning to the ghetto, they were deported to a forced labor camp, but took shelter again in the convent where they remained in hiding until the end of the war. This piece is called Self-Portrait. Let's talk about this after you look at it. So to the left are all the folks um, in the ghetto with their arms up and to the right is a, a, a vision of the boy, the Warsaw Ghetto Boy with the Jewish star, Star of David. Yes. I think, Loli Clara, I think the colors symbolize that they, the dehumanization of the human being it's like they're almost not there yeah the shapes they're very pale you know they're like um a, a ghost or a specter i think i don't i i agree yeah and the this is leah the the boots are are real right the boots are there where the boy yes. right. the that's boy is that's really interesting mm -hmm. yeah and that goes back to the collecting of all the shoes by the Nazis. So if you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., you see a huge, huge, huge pile of shoes that they took. And often, if they were ones that could be given to, um, you know, they were nice, preserved shoes, they could give them to uh, children or Nazis in um in the camps who were you know guarding the camps but other than that they just piled them up as a symbol of 
what was no more. I think in her face, you see hopelessness and despair. And okay, this is, this is him. Yeah, this, oh, is, it? Yeah, this okay. is a self-portrait of Bach. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. So it looks yes. like it's hope and despair on his face because he doesn't know what to do, where to go, what's next in his life. Um, yeah. In what direction he should go. I, yes. I also see acceptance in uh, the boy, in, you know, in his uh, eyes. Now the other, the, War, the Warsaw boy has horror. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like, whatever happens, it's gonna happen. Yeah. There's also a strong sense of, to me, it's contradictory. It's an aloneness, but at the same time, he's placed himself there with the memories of the people who are now gone. So he's with others who who have been killed, but he's also very alone. Yes. So the, the people who have been killed are not only here. He's tried to piece together these, but they're also down here. These stones are what we put on graves. Jew, Jews put on the graves to... Um, anytime we go to the cemetery to remember someone, we add another stone. So these represent pages of people's lives that have been lost. This is Rodna. Yes, Rodna. He looks like he's just a bag of empty content in a burlap bag. Mm. Uh, just to be thrown away. And again, he has his crematorium smoke in the distance. Yes. Mm -hmm. In one of the Holocaust, in one of the European, Eastern European, I think it was Prague, um, there is a representation of the shoes along a riverbank. And it reminds me of that because they would line the Jews up in front of a river and ask them to take their shoes off. And when they did, they would shoot them and they would fall into the Danube. And yes. Reminded me of that. This um, in, in and out of a, of a bag, um, he's either trying, he's trying to get up. From yeah, yeah. Contained, whatever. So is that a body bag that he's thinking he might end up in? It, it could be. Could be. Yeah. This over here, this abyss, um, is reminiscent, too, of um the 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 pits that Jews were shot into um and that this I almost put a picture of those shoes along the bank someone has done a, a, an amazingly moving um sculpture of all these shoes along um along a, a walkway um as Rodna said it's so moving and um yeah over here, also reminiscent of Torah scrolls that were desecrated. And this could even be part of that, that we could, you know, t those, the Nazis tore up or tore out the, the scrolls of the Torah, the parts, the parts of the Torah. And those could be the stones in memory of that too. I want you to um, pay attention to these holes in the hands because it's very Christological. Just as Jesus was nailed, um, the, the ghetto boy was shot through the hands. So he is continually um, engaging his Holocaust experience with um, that of the the convent where I'm sure being there he, he got a lot of influence from the nuns so he does use he continues to use a lot of um, holocaust imagery I mean um, Christological imagery 
I'm going to go on. Hand. What's in his hand? Is it a pen or? It looks like a pen. Maybe maybe it's his drawings, you know, his drawing instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at his question mark in the lower left, it looks like it ends, go up right there, go up. Yeah. It looks like it's a cat or an eye. Right. Yes. I, th I thought that too. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to go to another one. Here are two more. We don't have to talk about each one of them, but I just want to show you how much he used this imagery. And in this one, it looks like he has imposed his own growing face, you know, as he got older onto the ghetto boy. Um, the star of David is here, but it's, it's all torn apart. And he, he, as an artist and as a Jew, as a survivor, is trying to nail things back together. And again, there's another prop up here. All right. I don't know why this isn't going there. Here, the, the yeah. it's actually bl um, blood is coming down from the hands. Someone want to talk about one of these? Well, Loli Clara here. Uh, Go ahead. His hands, they are like uh, Christ's hands with the nails. Yes. Through them. Yep. And, uh, or Jesus's hands. And, um, and they're up, like saying, um, you know, don't kill me, but. But yet it's, we have the one picture in, with him facing forward and the other one with his back. Mm hmm So, really amazing. Yeah. Yulia, did you have something? <clears throat> is somewhere ready to be shot? Yes, it's it's surrender in in you know it it is surrender. But both of them have the Jewish star that they were required to wear. Yes. All right, I'm going to go on. Oh, look at the cross. Um, so those of you who know your Bible, what does this remind you of? Who else had wood tied to their backs? I'm, I'm thinking um, Jewish Bible. Yes, it is. It's, it's, um, it's talked about again in, in um, Christian Bible, but the Jewish Bible in Genesis. We read it on Rosh Hashanah, the Akedah, the, the near sacrifice of Isaac. When Abraham brings Isaac up to um, Mount Moriah and Isaac is carrying the, his own wood for the sacrifice. And it is something that, that Christianity picks up again in the Gospels, that Jesus was required to carry his own cross to uh, Golgotha. This one over here, there's a sense of the monastery here and the child peeking out, um, trying to be sheltered there while the world around them is, you know, disappearing. But what is the significance of the cup and the spoon? Um, I think hunger, just, just really hunger. There's another question mark here that right the there. cup has yeah, the cup has broken off um, the handle. So uh, where is my next meal coming from? That was a constant 
um, question for them. The holes in the shoe. Hi, Lily Clarigan. I find that all the pictures have to do with him as a boy or, or the other little Warsaw boy. It's like, I think his greatest horror comes from what the Nazis did to the children. Yes, yes. That's what he wants to remind us of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there might be one more of this. Oh, no, I'm taking you into something else. Okay, this, um, I just wanted to tell you that this is a um, very intricate painting because he is using Jewish interpretation of texts in this to interpret for himself a Kabbalistic view of the Holocaust. So the first letters of these words here, pardes, um, and those are the, the, the Hebrew letters, which this is a samich, this is the one of them, which um, indicates sod, mystical Kabbalistic meanings. This is drash, discovered meanings and applications. We can't even see, um, well, this is remes right here, the whole word. Um, typologic, typolo oh, I can't even say it, typological or allegorical interpretations. So he uses a lot of those. I can't find the pshat, the simple literal interpretation written down. Maybe because there it is in front of us. Destruction. So the first letters um, mean garden or paradise. And um, beginning in medieval Spain became the basic principles of interpretation of Jewish texts. So literal, philosophical, inferred, and mystical. So what are, what are the, the, um, the iconic symbols or allegorical interpretations here from what you, what you can think about? This is Wendy again. And am I on? Okay. Um, one of the first things I see is looking at the structures <clears throat> from without the tops on them and yes. the arches. The first thing I immediately thought of was the Ten Commandments. Exactly. Yes. Yep. What else? Amazing. Yes, there's a maze in there. And this maze here is also reminiscent of the unrolling of the Torah scrolls, which sometimes reading Torah and interpreting Torah can be a maze of um, things repeating and, uh, you know, uh, being repeated in many, many times, uh, word, particular words. So, yeah. Good. And in terms of, let me just say, in terms of Holocaust, what would that maze be represent of the Torah? Which was the five books of Moses. Good question. Yes. A question? You want to say more about that? <clears throat> the the maze, uh, you know, uh, the Torah, the maze, the the <clears throat> interrelationship, and it almost looks like there's holes in parts of it. Uh huh. That, um, it, it, just the whole experience of finding your way, getting getting through the process, um, understanding the why, the the roadblocks to getting you know to to happiness maybe. Mm. Yes. 
In the lower left hand corner in that door, it looks like there's a person there. And there's a barrier that looks like a cross. Yep, it's an upside down cross. Yep. And there's a question mark again with the smoke. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And I think the last one on the screen, right, showing there's nothing left. Um, uh, it's completely bare. Empty. This one here. Yeah. Means yeah. Everything's gone. And the only thing it looks like in the background, in the very, very back, is the Ten Commandments. Looks like the two tablets could be the Ten Commandments. Uh huh. Like yeah, right there. Everything, but I think everything else is gone. Yeah. It's appeared. So it's basically saying what, what was there is no longer there. Mm. And right and, under the tree in that bare spot almost looks like a hand kind of pointing up. This one right here. Wait, here? Oh, go right under no, the tree in the barren part of that far right the lawn was just talking about go down a little bit now to the left just a hair that looks like a hand with a finger pointing up towards god maybe one of the branches you mean nope just into the stone right there you're oh, on right the here of the hand. Oh, yeah. yeah yeah i didn't it almost looks it. like a yod even a yod yeah. or the near tummy now that i'm looking more carefully yeah mm -hmm. that so too the the Ner Tamid is the um, the the light, the eternal light that never goes out, that keeps God's presence, you know, in front of us. Over here, there's a book. It's a Bible. It could also represent a person. Um, one one Holocaust. Um, book has used the the uh, oh sorry one Holocaust artist has used the book to represent the burning of people because there was uh, the famous saying those who burn books um, can eas very easily turn to burning people and that was before the Holocaust that that statement was said and um, then indeed it happened. Fahrenheit 451. Yes, yes. <laughs> the is, whole that a, about it. Yeah. is that a ramp coming down from the top, going down towards the book? And then behind the book, is that a crematorium? There's Yes, the crematorium is right here. And it looks like a, some kind of a stairway going down here. Right. Yeah. And behind, under the question mark, there are two circular things. Are those people or Torah? Uh, two right, right here. There, right there. I think, I think there, it's Torah, yeah. But here, it looks like a, um, a pile of skulls and bones. Yeah, maybe. On the bottom right, um, over the uh, yellow awning, yeah, with the green door. That there's another Hebrew letter. Is that a that this one here? Bottom or right. Over. Keep going. Keep going to the right. The other right. Oh, <laughs> the other right. <laughs> the other right. Keep going. Right. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. Up. See, it looks like a bet. I don't know if that's like for bite, for house, for right, bet. right here. Yeah, bet. Um. It could be, or it could be um, the be maybe that's the beginning of the shot, um, it but it's broken be. if it is. What? So this maybe he's saying if it's for shot the the pay, a broken pay, he's he may be saying that the simple literal interpretation can no longer be valid, which is why we need to add the questions in. I don't know. There's so much in this one. Yeah, because that doesn't really look like a pay, but no, it would be um, it would be a broken. It would have to be a broken pay because yeah. the, the pay would look, you know, bring down, come down here. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's interesting that um, 
this one may be this door may be open a little bit, but everything else is closed up. It seems well, that you know are you, condemned, maybe condemned. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go into another one. This is the same one, but he does have um, Pardes written here. This whole thing for him is the destruction of paradise. Um, meaning the Garden of Eden, meaning the the whole of um, the spiritual life of the Jews. It, it's gone up in smoke. And yet, and yet, there's a pathway to the tree of life. Mm -hmm. He is never, ever willing to give up the tree of life. Well, look at the doors too, from the left to the right. Uh huh. It's like there are different stages. You see how from the left to the right of the do each door, the Samach, the Dalit, you know. Yeah. You see how it's very condemned, awful. It's like look like it's getting better. There's a door opening, and then, it, you know, it, almost like a progression of, it's something's getting better. Perhaps. Yeah. Well, if you if you look at it though with the interpretive um, thing, so the shot was the simple explanation. Maybe the simple explanation is there is still a tree that's rooted, and then um, the the race was a the iconic um, explanation that we can rebuild maybe the drash is it's it's see it's it's not there and it's not open yet it's stuff in front of it so the that was the how to make sense of this how to give an interpretation you know for it and then the so the 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 secretive the um spiritual kabbalistic um explanation is not even available right now for him so um but yeah so the simple explanation is open that way is open the tree of life is still standing it's still rooted how would you interpret in the in the so section the two ladders being of you know at first it's like is he is are people trying to escape the crematorium climbing to god but then the other one is shorter are they escaping the crematorium or are they coming into it or there's because they're not equal in height it's not a clear path in or out i think this one looks like it's <clears throat> it's set from the outside maybe yeah. people are trying to rescue and mm -hmm. this is i think this is the way to the the final ascent to heaven that's that's my view I, I don't know his that's kind of what i was thinking and saying is because yeah it, it was a way to go over the wall but yet because the one was so much higher they couldn't yes. quite get there to escape so yeah. that's a good interpretation you presented to heaven on to heaven yeah the um the the germans themselves the the trek up to the crematoria they or or the or the gassing they called the um the way to heaven so you know ironic In all right okay you can go back what you're talking about the smoke that's coming from the crematory yes it, it looks like um it's so dark in the bottom but it gets lighter and you can try to figure out perhaps uh, a godly kind of a um, figure or a mass or something that's that's above um that as you go up it's 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 more clear I, I, like liberating I, I think. yeah and also yeah. i've noticed that in his pictures on the left side of his picture is usually much more devastation mm -hmm. because you look at the um, at the landscape and it's dark. And on the right side, he always seems to have um, some green of nature or something where there's sunlight or um, 
regrows? Yes. Yeah. I don't want to talk too much about this except to say, you know, this is another example of what he does with the ghetto boy and the, the cross, um, the, the hands being pierced. Um, Aaron, what are the dates of some of these works of art? Um, he started, I think he started painting in 19 in the 1950s so but he's still painting so he's still doing this yes this type of yes. holocaust all right yes yep okay. um the the pucker gallery in boston represents him and he lives in western weston w-e-s-t-o-n massachusetts okay um okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go a little further. Has Esther Parnim, um, God uh, who cannot be, um, who abandons us, we cannot find God's face. I am considered among the dead who are free as the slain who lie in the grave, whom you no longer remember and who were cut off by your hand. You have put me in the lowest pit, into dark places, into depths, why, O oh Lord, do you abandon my soul? Do you hide your countenance from me? Why, O oh Lord, do you abandon my soul? Oh, I put that in twice. No, <laughs> um, oh, I put it in three times. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened there. You have estranged me from lover and friend. My acquaintances are in a place of darkness. This is from Psalm 88. It's considered to be the darkest psalm. And it's, it's also called the dark night of the soul psalm. It has no hope. There's no hope in this. Every other psalm has hope in it. This one has none. And so it is. it can be considered to be a Holocaust, um, one that most aptly fits what people went through in the Holocaust. Yes. Oh, wow. Someone was wanting to comment. Um, I, think I can tell right away that that's not Bach. <laughs> yes, it's it's very different from Bach's style. Um, this is a French painter. Um, he was in Auschwitz, um, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I will just tell you, David Ollier. I, I don't know, but what do you see here? Despair. Despair. Despair someone's Despair. saying here. Yes. He too uses. Um, biblical imagery. Is there anything that reminds you of something from the book of Exodus? Yeah, well, they're making pyramids in the back. Yeah, the whatever they were doing, the the ashes, probably most likely, um, were set up looking like pyramids and, of course, slave labor. Um, slave labor, Jewish hands, um, built the Audubon in Germany. I, I, when I read that for the first time, having been on the Audubon, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I was on a highway that was built by, by Holocaust um, prisoners. And that was, you know, I don't know, took my breath away. Um, what are the elements you see here? She said it's a powerful painting. It is a powerful painting. I, I, I saw a family 
a what? It, 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 it's something like this. I don't know. She said she saw, she sees a family and something above them is, is like death. Yes. Yes. So, um, yeah, someone was. I was going to say that they, they're saying that there's a lot of people who died, but we've got to move on. And we've got to try to escape death with even, we have very little life left in us, but we have a desire to continue living. And we've got to keep memories of the people who, who died, um, you know, in the back of our mind as courage to help us go forward, even though we, uh, we may be in despair. Yeah. And yet, look what's right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. SS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who you who are going to stop them? Right. Because old women, mothers with babies, children who weren't able to work, went directly to the gas chambers. They didn't even waste a bowl of soup on them. They sent them from the trains directly to the gas chambers. What what a powerful painting. What a powerful painting. And the, <clears throat> yes, the, the child on the on the far right looks like he's it could be a doll that, that it's holding, but it also looks like a Torah. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this one has food that they will never get a chance to eat their bag will be taken whatever's in it will be distributed to you know if anything is of value there to look at the family though it doesn't look like there's much of value that they've brought along with them except their lives it so looks like the ukrainians yes and we haven't learned anything in 70 years yeah no. i am i'm working with um, an afghanistan family <laughs> Afghanis, Afghanistan. That's not right. Afghan, Afghani. Afghani. Thank you. <laughs> Family um, who came, who were told to leave on the last day that they could go off on the plane. And um, they took nothing. I mean, they took a bag of just what they could gather at that very second. The father called the mother and said, meet me here. And she grabbed as much as she could, but she had three small children, so there was not much she brought. And um, they're they're being helped now, but um, you know, for a while they were in in um, one of those big tent cities in Virginia somewhere, where each family had their own small tent under a larger tent, and they they literally had nothing. And there's so many who are coming here with nothing. Uh, it's just like that, except we're not putting them to death, thank God. Um, you know, we we have to try to do as much as we can for those those who are coming. Keep the I doors. Also, yes. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say I also see the 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 the, the man, um, you know, on on the top, as being maybe a father or a grandfather. To this family because he's the one in the camp because he's the one that you know can produce the labor yes yeah yeah all right let's go into the next one what time is it by the way because it's 2 20. okay um we are definitely not to, going to get on, uh, got, get through this whole thing. I'm going to go quickly through without talking because I want to show you um, some uh, some other things. So let, let's just go on really quickly. These are all David O'Leary's. This one, the artist always brings the memory of his time those are his numbers that are on his forehead here 
but he brings along his num his the memory of himself there, drags it over him, carries it, so to speak. Here's another one. Um, yeah, that one. Um, so, so like I said, this is only only a taste of what um, this is Judy Chicago. Um, she did a whole thing called the Holocaust Project because she realized that she didn't know enough about the Holocaust here. Jews are depicted with horns because that's how the people on the outside thought of us, that we had <coughs> horns. We were demons, we were devils. And it gave them even a better reason to kill us. Um, Jews being forced into there. Here, pigs are being taken, you know, to the slaughterhouse, but here are the Jews. Um, okay. Um, that was another Bach. Um, these were sketches that O'Leary did when he first got out. Um, he, as soon as he got out, he started drawing all of the things, all of his memories, so he would keep them. No statement, theological or otherwise, should be made that would not be credible in the presence of the burning children. What a what a thing! So, I asked my students, my my high school students, what are some of those statements? They said that it's your fault, or um, because this is a Jewish school that I taught at, that because you didn't believe in Jesus you would you were this is what you were suffering because it had been said that in other theological um not jewish ones but other 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 theological um interpretations of what was going on so um yes if you could not say this statement in front of the children who were burning to death then it can't be said at all and here is the gas chamber. Yeah, it's uh, very powerful. There are, if you go to the Holocaust, uh, if, if you go to Auschwitz and you go to the gas chamber, um, you can see the scratchings of the people who tried to get out. Even more important than the question of where was God, where was man? Judy Chicago banality of evil here the people are down here enjoying a quiet cafe experience and up here they're being taken to the gas chamber saying you all were were um to blame you who turned your eyes away this is george siegel um i'm not going to talk too much about this there's a whole explanation of what it it means but I will say that he asks us to be part of the participation of this man looking out. What was it like to be a survivor when all of your friends were dead? What is it like for us to look at the survivor? And what does it mean when he chose to use um, not, not, the skinny, you know, skeletal people for his his sculpture. Okay. There has been too much asking where was God in Auschwitz and not enough who was God in Auschwitz. Melissa Raphael has written a fabulous book called The F Female Face of God in Auschwitz and talks about how the women brought back the image of Shekhinah, the feminine aspect of God, in the way they shared, in the way they prayed, in the way that they um, stitched together their memories, their recipes, bringing the Shabbat light, even though there, was, there were no candles, they would still say the blessing and imagine the candles. This is one that I did 
interrupting heaven. Um, how we now have to say, we have to question our own assumptions of God in, um, in our lives, how we can keep the idea of God, how we can uh, reach out to God, how can we interrupt heaven to get to God. This is one I did, Tattooed Women, based on Psalm 88. Um, this is, I, I tattooed in, you know, in, in paint, all of the words to Psalm 88 on the, the torsos of, of um, these plaster women. And this is one that I did, the Women's Megillah, which took um, witness, witnesses' words and made them into a scroll. We have a, the Megillah means scroll. So we have a scroll of Esther. We have a scroll of um, certain uh, books of the Bible. And so I wanted to make a woman's, women's scroll because I was, I was so um, taken with all the women's memoirs that have been published or have been shared um, by various groups that are collecting them. Erin, was that fabric? Yes, that was all quilted. Um, let me go back that to is, that. That is gorgeous. I've never seen that before of your work. I, I should bring it to Temple sometime. You know, it would have been nice to have it during the Holocaust um, Memorial service. Um, but it's buttons. The, she talks about buttons, and this one talks about um, clothing, and this one talks about how she had to hide her jewels in her private parts. Um, so there, there are all of these uh, um, words of the people, the words of the women. Um, so it's it's paint and fabric and um, and then I I uh, this is all my what do you call it <laughs> my um, using my Bernina uh, I I put the words on with the sewing machine. This is Akiva Basque. He's the son of a rabbi. He's a former student of mine from the former Hebrew American Hebrew Academy. He's a recent graduate of Ringling School of Art and Design. I just bought this piece from him. It's called Desecration of My Temple. He is upon him, upon the weight of his talit, which is his prayer shawl. He is hearing all the new anti-Semitic tropes. Hitler was right, and um, you know, Holocaust is a lie. And he, uh, so this is a, a graphic piece. He did not write on his talit, but he's got his tefillin on, which is the reminder of uh, what a, a Jew wears to remember all of the aspects of God being on their head and around their arms by their hearts, um, along with being covered by the prayer shawl. I thought this was an amazing piece. And so I wanted to include it in this because young people are still dealing with the Holocaust and questioning what they should do about it and how they should as artists depict it. Um, I'm not going to show you the rest because it, it, it's too much to talk about right now. But thank you all. Let me let me get out of the screen sharing. Um, thank you all for being here today. Go ahead. And for your for your comments. Yes. Yes, I would like to say something. After yes. watching this last yesterday was in Israel independent um, whatever day was. Remember day. day, and it was so thrilling to see all the little Jewish kids running around free with their youngest and just so happy, and it did my heart so good to see that, and especially watching this right now, it was wonderful to see. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else have comments or questions? I want to know what, in your opinion, is the main reason for Holocaust? 
short, in short, a few sentences. What is the main reason for Holocaust? In your opinion, religious reason, other reasons. What is the main reason? The reason. I, in my opinion, there is no reason for the Holocaust. I don't think we can even think of it in those terms, in, in my opinion. Um, I, I believe that um, the idea of, of Jewish otherness has been going on for years and Hitler was in a place where he wanted power and this was one of the ways that he could get power um, by addressing the positions of Jews in his country, who he said was taking, were taking up all the jobs. Um, that's not a good reason to kill people and to try to, uh, you know, carry out a, a worldwide genocide. I mean, he wanted to go further than where, where he did. Um, so I don't think we can think of it in terms of why did it happen? Um, it's it's just too much beyond us to even think in terms of that. Um, but thank you, because it, it we do think about it anyway. But it, it's it's hard to give a reason. Karen, I appreciate so much. Again, you've been my teacher for many, many, many years, and um, for those of you that have not had an opportunity to see some of the other works of art that Karen does and many, many medias. Uh, I encourage you to, to try and see some of the things. She interprets each person uh, with their thoughts included as when she made the Tully for our daughter, she, she included her, her life history into her Tully and, and our, our, um, our path to adoption with Alexa. And we treasure it every day when, when we see her wrapped in it. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> that is so sweet. Well, thank you all very much. And again, Wendy, thanks to Carolina Foundation for Jewish Seniors for sponsoring this, for funding the funds for us to be able to do this. And Karen, I will reach out and we will talk about our next steps. Great. Thank you.